I see your PowerPoint presentation. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started then. Thank you all so much for coming to uh, our weekly COVID check-in and meetup for librarians. Um, I believe this is part five. Um, and I hope that you all are hanging in there and uh, taking good care of yourselves. Um, we've had a tradition of starting with three deep breaths. Um, I think Tracy is on here. If Tracy, if you would like to lead this, last week I was a bit of an outlier, but if you'd like to lead us this week, feel free to. But you did such a great job last time. <laughs> That's but a you good know better. That's a glacier always makes me take three deep breaths. Actually, all right. So this is just our. Uh, as Amelia said, our weekly three deep breaths in case you've been running around like crazy and need to take a pause. So wherever you're at, uh, if you want to feel the weight of the chair supporting you or if you happen to be standing, the weight of the floor beneath your feet, sometimes it really helps to just kind of feel that point of contact. And then we're just going to take three deep breaths. When I um, count to three, take whatever breath feels right for you. Everybody's different. But what you're trying to do here is just stop breathing from your chest because that's what we tend to do when we're stressed out and we're running around is we don't actually use our diaphragm. So you want to make your belly go in and out on the count of three, three times, okay? So one, two, three. Amelia, it's all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tracy. And I do encourage everybody to take time to do the three deep breaths. I've been doing that every now and then, and it really does help. So today's agenda is here. We have actually quite a bit that we are hoping to cover. Um, so we, we will try to keep within the hour. Um, we might run over, but if you do have to head out at four, that's totally fine. Uh, the first thing we want to discuss is Montana's reopening plan. So Governor Bullock had a press conference this afternoon and it'd be good to discuss over the information released then. Then we're gonna talk about reopening the library and staged plans in general. Um, so we've put together some information on that um, to share with you all. And then for staff talking about safety and emotional well-being, not just now as we're still in shelter in place and social distancing, but later on, once we do start to reopen the library and depending on how that looks, making sure that we're all taking care of ourselves. And then talking about for patrons, managing their conflicting needs and wants, um, balancing that with the safety of all um, and also adhering to reopening guidelines. And then for everyone, long-term resilience um, and sort of what we can learn from this and what we can do in the future. Um, so we will be monitoring the chat box. Uh, feel free to put in any questions there and we'll be sure to read them out. Um, so please do comment at any point in time. So the first thing we'll be talking about is what Governor Bullock uh, covered in the press conference today. And I believe Jenny is on the call right now. So Jenny, if you'd like to unmute yourself and uh, discuss with us, that'd be great. Great, thanks Amelia. And thanks for everyone for joining us. Uh, Governor Bullock did have a press conference at noon today where he issued his uh, reopening the big sky guidelines, which is a phased approach, phases one, two, and three, uh, and did announce that uh, at the end of the current stay-at-home directive, which ends uh, on Friday, April 24th, we will be entering into phase one of the reopening. And there's links there that Amelia has provided in the PowerPoint that I encourage you all to review. Um, a couple of key highlights that I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of in um, phase one, there will be uh, the allowance for certain 
organizations and businesses to reopen under some strict guidelines um, that really allow for social distancing. Uh, organizations will have to uh, be able to ensure the, the cleanliness of their facilities. And um, they're still encouraging people to uh, stay at home if you're um, a vulnerable population or liver or um, have families with vulnerable populations. They're still encouraging people to wear masks when in public. Uh, importantly, he encourages people to avoid groups of greater than 10 people or more at any one time and only in places that allow for appropriate social distancing of groups of that size. Um, for employers that are uh, reopening and bringing people back to work, um, the directive encourages people to make sure that they are checking with their employees with regard to their health status to make sure that people are still well and if they're feeling unwell that they are staying at home. Uh, returning to work, people should again continue to adhere to those social distancing practices um, as much as possible. The order does allow groups like church congregations to uh, once again resume their uh, normal um, Sunday morning worship services, but again, um, families can sit together um, but must maintain proper social distancing from other members of the congregation, for example. Um, specifically with regard to schools, the governor is not necessarily calling for the reopening of schools. He's going to leave that decision up to local school districts to decide. Um, the governor has called for the reopening of um, certain businesses in phase one. Some of those businesses uh, will be allowed to reopen a little bit later. Uh, not immediately after April 24th, but for example, uh, bars and restaurants and breweries and distilleries can reopen for table service effective May 4th, again, allowing for proper social distancing. So those businesses will only be allowed to accommodate up to 50% of their normal clientele. Uh, for example, in a restaurant with table service, they wouldn't allow for groups larger than six people, and those groups must uh, allow for proper social distancing from other groups. There's a lot more detail available in the directives themselves. The governor said that he is not putting a timeline on when he would move to phase two, which allows for more increases in social activities, an increase to groups to up to 50 people um, and those, those kinds of changes. Um, he, again, is not putting a timeline on when he anticipates making that move, but we'll continue to look at uh, the health metrics and ensuring that we're continuing to see a decline in the number of cases of COVID-19 before making any kind of move to phase two. And he also reiterated that if we see any kind of surge in cases that we may have to go back to some kind of stay at home order. So he did leave that kind of table. So I think that there's some really important takeaways for us as we look at these directives. I think it'll be important for libraries to think about the number of patrons you typically serve and whether or not that number falls above or below that uh, maximum of 10 individuals at any one time, and whether or not in your individual libraries, if you had that number of people gathered, you'd be able to maintain proper social distancing um, in your interactions with those patrons, in patrons' interactions with one another, uh, use of public access machines, uh, and some of those kinds of things. So, I think that there's some helpful information here that we can consider as libraries are considering their own reopening plans. Um, and again, uh, really being mindful of the fact that um, 
employees who are feeling unwell should be encouraged to stay home. The directive does say that um, the governor encourages employers to be flexible with employees and allow for teleworking wherever possible. I think that's an important, important consideration to keep in mind as well. Um, but really keep that maximum number of 10 individuals in a group gathering in mind as you're thinking about your reopening plans, thinking about how you can maintain social distancing, um, maintaining the cleanliness of your facilities, which is going to be very important, encouraging people to continue to wear masks and other kinds of protective materials when they're in those kinds of public settings. And again, um, there is the possibility that the governor could reinstitute a stay-at-home directive uh, and no timeline for when we may move to phase two. I think that covers sort of the highlights of what the governor announced in his directive today. And I did drop the uh, two document links into the chat box so that you guys can click on it there. And those links are also in the COVID-19 guide. Um, so you guys can find those, find them there as well. I'm curious as to where they see libraries fall within these guidelines. I, you know, I read all this stuff online already and I'm not even getting a hint as to where we would fall. Any idea? Well, Nancy, the governor would certainly say that he would leave any specific directives up to local governments and local administrators to decide. Um, but like I said, I think you need to think about your library, the size of your library, the number of people that might typically be in your library at any one time whether or not you can accommodate that number of patrons while still allowing for the six feet of social distancing. Does that help? It helps somewhat. I, I have to admit, I'll have to wait to find out where the county sits on all of this because they're, they're ultimately are going to say one way or the other. I just didn't know if, if somebody in some ways said, you know, libraries are kind of important. Maybe they should think about opening up or, you know, be one of the first ones to open. I mean, I'm seeing tattoo parlors and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, so where does the library fit in <laughs> with the tattoo parlor? And Nancy, we will have us, we will next be talking about, um, reopening plans and maybe that will sort of help to address where libraries fit in with things and we'll have some examples of, of reopening plans too so you can see uh, some libraries and who they've consulted with um, in creating their plan and kind of their communication strategy as well um, so that might be able to give you a little bit more clarity too All right, any other questions about this section? And I imagine that this will probably be a, an ongoing discussion. Um, so this isn't the only chance that you have to ask questions about this. Um, but we might move on for the sake of time, if that's okay with you, Jenny. Please feel free. Okay, cool. All right, so next I believe Pam will be talking about actually reopening the library um, and doing that in stages, which seems to be the trend for um, this topic. It does seem to be the popular uh, trend from everything I've been looking at. And I had put this all together, of course, before this afternoon and the governor's announcement, but a lot of this still falls in under that plan pretty well. Um, First, you want to think about, you know, when and how are you going to 
open, reopen the library. Um, but like we just said, that really you want to communicate with your local city or county health department and get their guidance and find out their guidelines they're talking about and, and work with them to see what they think is going to work best in your county. You might be in a county with no cases and it's very rural, so you might be able to do more than some of us who live in some of these hotspot counties where things are a little bit dicier um, or you might be in a larger library. So um, I think talking to your local departments is a really good first step to do. But some other things to keep in mind, because I am kind of going to go through these a little bit quick because I know there's a lot this afternoon that we have lined up here. Um, one thing I did see is this is a great opportunity if you're closed to get some deep cleaning done in your library. No one is in there. Um, so it's possible you could get um, you could get some deep cleaning done. And also you want to See if you have these supplies, it might be difficult to get these supplies, um, but you want to have them available when you do open. Things like the Clorox wipes and other things. This link that's in here, the EPA list, is kind of an um, interesting table to look at. You can search through, if you're looking for Clorox wipes, you can search and find out brand names of things. Um, and also it'll tell you what is appropriate for disinfecting against this particular virus. So um, I thought this was an interesting link to look at. Um, and also a big thing to consider is really you want to focus on your staff safety. Um, they need to feel comfortable about coming back to work. You might have some staff that either have families with people who are somewhat compromised or they might be compromised and they may not feel comfortable coming back to work. So you need to have that as a consideration also because without your staff, you really don't have um, all the support and all the resources you need. So they are a big priority for you. Um, are you going to have gloves and masks available for staff um, when you do open? Um, keep in mind, keep that in mind also. So those were the, some of the things that came up as I was looking for this. And if you want to move on. Thank you, Amelia. Um, so then start thinking about what are you already doing? Some libraries are already um, offering curbside service or you have your book drops open. So you've been collecting books all along the way. People are returning their items. And I imagine a lot of libraries have gotten their little piles of book drops. Um, collected and I have even talked to libraries who said oh we've got piles all over the place and they have dates on them so we know when they were returned and how long they're going to be quarantined so you might be running out of space for that kind of thing so you you know might want to think about that um, honestly I forget what this link means the oh yeah this was the one from Wyoming the link in here was a really good um, staged opening plan you might want to think of just having your staff in when the library does open so that they can get caught up they can go through all those returned quarantine items before you start having other services whether you have curbside service or not or you let people in your building um, little bit by bit that was the staged idea also in the baby steps link that was in there. Um, you might have less hours when you open. I know people are thinking oh we want the library open and we want to open it wide open and go back to how we were um, and that's probably not going to happen right away. So you need to come up with we might only be open a few hours. You might have staff working staggered shifts so that they're not all in the library together if you're a larger library so that they're they can still be separated by the appropriate distances and still manage to get some of the work done and they might still continue to work remotely also it depends on your library and what services you're trying to offer but start thinking about all that when you do open you might need to rearrange your furniture so you can follow those guidelines from the governor's um, declaration today also of 
distance between people. If you're going to offer computer access, you may need to have every other computer or only one computer per row. If you have a lot of rows and computers available, you may have to rethink some of that or take appointments so that you have limited people coming into the library and you can monitor it that way. Um, there's all sorts of ideas and things in here to think about. Um, and then also just keep in mind how if things get worse again, are you going to be able to close? Are you going to be able to go back to reducing services? How are you going to communicate that? That's the big thing to keep in mind also is just how are you communicating all of this? Are you going to communicate this on your social networks? Has that been working pretty well for you? Does your city have a way to make announcements? Do you have things in the newspapers? Um, bulletin boards are using your door as a bulletin board to the library. A lot of libraries are doing as a way to keep information available and out there. So that's something to keep in mind. And one other thing that I did here in a couple of things I've been researching on is you might need to have a discussion with your board about budget things that might come up. You might have to reallocate some funding from one, one thing to another or if the budget in your county is not going to look so good because we've had all sorts of impacts, economic impacts, you might need to rethink your budget and it wouldn't be too soon to start thinking about that too. That's about all I can come up with on this because so much of it depends on your local situation too. So we can't say everybody's going to do it this way. Um, you are going to talk to your local governments and find out what's going to work in your situation. Mm -hmm. And real quick, I did drop the links into the chat box, both for the uh, library.wyoming.gov plan and the ClickWeb plan. Um, and Jenny did mention in the comments, also think about how you might maintain the cleanliness of our libraries if and when you do reopen. Exactly. The, the that's governor's reopening plan makes some requirements for regular cleaning. Yeah. So that's something to definitely uh, keep in mind. Yes. Great. Um, and later on, I do have some other plans linked in a separate guide on reopening and re-entry, uh, and I'll show that to you. But for now, um, Joe will talk about, for staff, safety and emotional well-being. Hi, everybody. Um, some of you know that I um, have served as a volunteer firefighter and EMT, currently retired from those positions, but I learned a lot about responding to tense emergency situations and that that um, you know basically suffering from from being in a trauma and to today I wanted to share with you some ideas about taking care of your staff not only their physical well-being but also their emotional well-being because you really can't have a have safe sustainable operations without that so we're gonna put on your firefighters hat um, virtually and think like a firefighter a little bit today and imagine that we've had some um, traumatic response that was um, a, a disaster an emergency that got our adrenaline up and um, we're now past that and kind of recovering and thinking about how it all went and so that's kind of the stage that we're in and don't underestimate how much trauma we've all suffered uh, these past few weeks it's just been drawn out a little bit more and maybe you don't feel like you've had an imminent um, threat but the threat has really been there and so I want to suggest some things that we can do to kind of ameliorate the um, and improve our ability to be resilient and to recover so if you go to the next slide um, we're going to try to build some safety nets for our staff here today and um, I want, these are some considerations you might want to make as you're looking at uh, returning to work and you know your staff, you want to be thinking about some of their physical attributes. Um, maybe they have underlying physical conditions. Maybe you don't know about them. Maybe you need to know now. Um, they may have additional risk of exposure at home. In my case, my husband's a paramedic. So if he, he works uh, extended 
shifts in a hospital setting, a rural hospital. So when he comes home, um, we really don't know if he's been exposed or not. And so we have, we consider him a very high risk person. You can look at the OSHA guidelines um, on different types of occupations and actually librarians because of your physical contact with the public in your regular job would be considered um, not a low risk but a, a medium risk at least depending on how good you are at keeping staff safe so keeping that risk really low and then maybe making special accommodations for some of your staff who may be older or may have an underlying physical condition so um, do you have any other physical issues you might be thinking about with your staff that you're worried about or concerned about? And then on emotional safety, um, your staff needs to feel confident that the library is going to keep them safe, that when they come back to work, that they're not going to be exposed unnecessarily. They're already going to be taking some risk more than they were when they were staying at home. So that can be um, upsetting. And they, they have to also be able to manage those family issues that are going on at home. I mean, we've got staff that have kids that may still be out of school. Some schools have already closed for the remainder of the school year. Um, there may be some of your staff that are losing an income at home. And so there may be financial impacts or part of their, one of their businesses is not gonna be operating. So you wanna be thinking about all those things that can be impacting them as well. So now what I'm gonna do is talk to you a little bit about how to, oper how to run a debrief session, the same way that we do uh, we did in, in, in when I was an EMT and a firefighter, and that's using this critical incident stress debrief model. So in this case, what you want to do, and I really recommend that you try to do this pretty soon, um, because we're now just kind of getting out of the trauma phase of this emergency that we've all been thrown into, and um, and we, there's a, it's a great opportunity to learn. And a debrief is a great opportunity to help staff really vent their frustrations or concerns and also for you to, to plan to, um, to do things really well going forward. So you want to organize these into fairly homogeneous small groups. So keep um, teams that usually work together together. Do these online if you can. If you have a spot where they can be safely um, socially distanced at the library and everybody wants to do it um, there, then you can certainly do that. You have to make sure that the room is really, really safe for people, emotionally safe and physically safe. So there's no fear of reprisals or pushback. Um, so in that case, you wanna use a whiteboard or chart paper and make some notes when everybody agrees to write something down. Otherwise, don't take notes and don't record anything so people feel really free to express their feelings. So you're gonna sit in a circle. Um, if you're running these, you're mostly going to listen and not respond. It's kind of like a brainstorming session. There's no wrong, right or wrong answers. Um, you do it soon, like I said, um, the research shows that the more time that's elapsed from the event, in this case we're talking about the library's closure, the less effective a debrief can be in terms of helping people um, resolve their, their emotional issues and get back on track. And of course, we, I think you, this is a really good time to institute that three deep breaths. You might need to do it a couple times. So there's a seven stage um, or seven uh, uh, step process that we're gonna use in this debrief model. So if you go to the next slide, Amelia, um, we're gonna go through those steps. And I have put together a handout that Amelia will be sharing um, uh, with all of this information. So you don't have to take a whole bunch of notes. So first, you're going to audit the impacts and basically you're going to ask some questions like how has the library's reduction in services impacted you? Um, how, have these, how are these changes? How is this event impacting you? How are you sleeping? Um, have you noticed any other, any other changes? 
that you're concerned about? Do you feel depressed? Are you getting enough exercise? Those kinds of things. Um, identify any immediate issues that your staff has with safety and security. Ask for questions like, how have you and your family adapted to this? Do you feel safe? Are you financially secure? Um, do you have family members that are higher risk because of their work or their current health? Those kinds of things that may, like, and again, this is not something you're gonna be writing down into anybody's personnel file, but inviting them to share um, something that might be useful to you as a manager to um, help make the library secure and safe for them. The next step is, and you, these don't have to go in order, but you want to be, give everyone an opportunity to really express their feelings. It's not a bad idea to have a few boxes of Kleenex at these events. The ones that I've involved, involved with oftentimes end up being very emotional. So what things have happened in the past few weeks that have given you concern is a good question. Um, People don't have to give personal information, but you do want to give them an opportunity to really express themselves. And don't forget to ask them what you could, what can, could we do to make, um, to give them hope or help them feel confident about returning to the library. So number four, Amelia, if you could click that advance, um, predict and plan for hurdles. So as you consider restoring these library services, what problems and concerns do people see? Ask them that. How do you plan to address these concerns? And then a very systematic review. Now you're looking at what things happen in what order in closing the library and what you've learned along the way, um, what you could do better, what went well with the shutdown, what did not go well. And if you have to curtail operations again, how should you do it differently? This starts to empower your staff to really feel like they're um, moving into um, the recovery phase of responding to an emergency and a crisis and that they're starting to make things and helping planning to, so things will go better. It starts to give them some control. So that's the systematic review. And then when we say seek closure, now we're not talking about closing the library, we're talking about an emotional closure. So what are they looking forward to? What can be done to reassure them? And, and, how, and what are their ideas to provide for an orderly restoration of library services? And what kind of follow-up is needed? And then fine, let's see, we're gonna go to six and seven next. Oh, did I miss six? I did, didn't I? I apologize for that. Well, uh, it's on the handout. Seek closure. That's we got the weather. Oh, no, we did do that one. Okay, re-entry is the last one. Emphasize that each person has absolute authority over their own personal safety. Now, I just want to mention, you know, as a firefighter and he, as an EMT, this was really emphasized in my training that if I didn't feel comfortable doing something, I didn't have to do it. I, I shouldn't do it and that I had responsibility to speak up for myself and to look out for my own safety, that it was really important. In fact, as an EMT, when you take your tests, if you do not have your personal protective equipment on as you enter a scene when you're doing the test, it's an automatic fail. And so there are almost nothing else in the test. There are a few other things that are automatic fails. Um, your patient dying isn't necessarily one, but you getting exposing yourself is. And so really emphasize that each person has that absolute authority for their own personal safety and tell them that both physical and emotional safety are really important. And that we can, of course, look out for each other as well. But that I know that librarians tend to be very giving people. And this is, this is a time when it's important to remind them that the most important person they need to give to is themselves. Make sure they're okay. So discuss plans for promoting safety in the workplace and invite them to discuss with you any flexible accommodations that they might need. So that's the seven step process for a critical incident stress debrief model. And um, I just wanna point out that 
Uh, this last slide is to remind you that we've been learning, you've all been learning a lot the last month. That's one of the reasons we're all so tired is that our brains have been adapting and we've been trying to think of new ways to do things and all of that does require quite a bit of um, mental energy. So these are my three takeaways. Understand the hazards in, in restoring services. Put safety first and remind everyone and do this any way you can think of that they have the right of authority over their own personal safety. That's all I have to say about that. Awesome. Oh, Thank yeah. you so much, Joe. Smooth seas do not make skillful sailors. So <laughs> we've been <laughs> over some rough seas, so you can bet we're getting more skillful. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed, that is very true. Um, Jenny, I wanted to point out in the comments that Jenny put in a, a link um, for a reopening plan, phased reopening plans for libraries as COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. So feel free to take a look at that. Um, I also wanted to see and pause and see if there are any questions about reopening, things that people are considering. Um, I know that everyone has a lot of questions about that and you know, conversations that are happening. So if there's anything specific that you'd like to uh, brainstorm with the group, please do feel free to, to ask that at this moment and we'll take some time to discuss that. So this is Tracy and this is a question a librarian asked me and I don't know the answer and can't resist asking when I have so many librarians on the call. Are any of you considering installing plexiglass to protect your staff? Just curious if anyone's doing that. Okay, thanks, Starla. Starla, yes. Okay. Kit from Bozen says yes. Kathy, yes. Enjoy. This is this is Angela in Polson, and our gentleman from Valley Glass is here right now. He's on the call. <laughs> wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is Joe, and my my uh, postmaster used. Um, just regular old like saran wrap film and taped it to the desk and up to the ceiling and that way she can change yeah. it out every couple days it's not a permanent installation i thought that was kind of brilliant idea yeah <laughs> um the local post office in helena uses is using shower curtains shower curtains <laughs> yeah uh, the the weighted ones so i think it makes it a little bit easier for it. yeah shower curtains so um, and then there's a couple other thing. Lewistown is, Joey says it's a great idea. She's going to look into it. Susie from Great Falls says yes. Um, Jody's wondered about if we should, but haven't figured out logistics or cost. Jenny says, I know we're gonna talk about patrons, but I think it will be important to keep in mind that many of our patrons are also going to feel the need to debrief. And that's actually a really good point, Jenny. Um, Christine said I hadn't even thought about it. Uh, Kelly says it's certainly something we're looking into as well. Susie said, I'm concerned about everyone has the right of authority over their own personal safety. Absolutely want to keep my staff safe, but I can't keep paying some of my people to work remotely as we reopen. Do I have to put the choice to take leave or come in and work to the staff? Um, well, I could I can say that um, when I when I say it that way, um, s staff who don't who who don't want to work can 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 certainly decide that they prefer to be on unemployment. I mean, I think though more more flexibility on that issue, and I don't know what specific um, thing that you're dealing with, is that they have the right to express to you that they don't feel safe and to um, and to have uh, whatever possible mitigations or ameliorations um, be put in place. I'm not suggesting that, that everybody, n nobody has to come to work because they're not as gonna be as safe at work as they are at home, because that is true. It's, it's much more of a reminding them that you expect them to let you know when, when they are not feeling safe or if they have suggestions for how to improve their safety, that that's something that you should be open to. I hope that's okay. And then I think a lot of it is like trying to um, work with someone who may have a disability and to accommodate those kinds of disabilities. And how as, as employers, 
of staff, we can figure out how to help them both be successful in their continued work and accommodating those kinds of concerns that they might have. I wanted to just add just very quickly uh, onto my post about debriefing with our patrons and, and um, this might address Mitch's comment just in, in some small way. You know, we, we view ourselves as community hubs, as our community living rooms. And I think libraries are going to be a place where people are going to want to gather as soon as we can, as soon as we are open in whatever size gatherings are allowable. And um, as a community, as we are grappling with the implications of what we've been experiencing, it's our shared nature to want to share those kinds of uh, impacts with our neighbors and, and with those in our community. And I think uh, one of the really critical things when we think about reopening is thinking about how we can create those kinds of opportunities for our communities to come together and really share um, what's been an, a, a, a really interesting um, shared experience for all of us. And for those who weren't able to see Mitch's uh, comment, um, he was asking about long-term sentiment towards um, the very thing public libraries are predicated upon, public sharing of space materials. And will people be wary of using the library in the months or years after this? Um, so yeah, that's definitely something to consider. Uh, Starla asked, the CARE Act is in play until December 31st, 2020, isn't it? And I do not actually know the answer to that question. If anyone knows and can chime in. Kara says, I think it extends through 2021. But she will verify. <laughs> Thanks, Kara. Um, and as we all are thinking about this, uh, I did put this link into the chat box earlier, but the Wyoming link, um, it's listed as link number four um, in the chat box. Uh, that I think actually, it says it's a Wyoming link, but I think it's actually from New Mexico. I think the New Mexico State Library was one of the first to um, create sort of this tiered reopening plan. So there's a lot of really good, questions to consider in that document and I think would be a good place for everyone to kind of start and digging into the, the specifics of what their personal plan for their library will look like. Um, so that's a, definitely a good, a good link to check out and, and look through. Um, and we have put together some other example plans from other libraries, some of which are in draft form, some of which have been approved by boards from across the country. Um, so you can see what other libraries are considering as well. Um, I think one really important thing to consider is how you're going to communicate this to your public. It's one thing to have these discussions and to decide as a team and as, as your library what you want to do and what the game plan is going to be, but it's another thing entirely to make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of what phase of the plan are you in, what is the plan, why have you made these decisions um, in your plan, and especially if we're moving back and forth between phase one or phase two, going back to phase one, then moving to phase three, having a way to make it really, really clear right off the bat to patrons what services your library is offering and um, and when. So I guess that kind of goes into the next topic of for, for patrons managing conflicting needs and wants. And so there aren't really any answers in this section. It's just more questions for you guys to think about. Um, but just some topics to consider, not just with staff and figuring out how to get how to reopen the building and how staff want to work and how workflows will be affected, but also communicating that to your patrons. So you're gonna have a wide variety of, of types of patrons and there's going to be that section of patrons who just see the word reopening and they're like, oh, that means everything's going back to normal. Um, and not just with the library, but with everything in general. They're like, oh, reopening, it's all going back. 
Um, so with those people, making sure that you have as a team really, really solid talking points in terms of why your library has made the decisions you've made, what phase you're in, and that everyone can explain that to patrons because I'm sure there will be some people who will be like, well, since we're reopening, shouldn't everything be back the way that it was before? So having that conversation is something that you'll probably have to do. And then there's also patrons who will still be worried about health and still be worried about um, cleanliness and safety and all of that, but will still need service. Um, and so having, again, talking points in place procedures that you can have on hand to reassure people, to show them that you are taking this seriously, um, and again, to help justify the decisions that your library has made um, for reopening. Uh, and then also just redirecting people to information channels that are reliable and authoritative um, and making sure that they're getting the information um, that is accurate and factual. Um, and especially if you're linking your reopening plans directly to those information channels, the official ones, I think that can further strengthen um, your plan and make it easier to explain um, and communicate to your public. Um, I put this other last bullet point on here in terms of guiding principles. Uh, at the moment, I, I don't have any, I couldn't really find anything online. I think this is sort of a burgeoning topic and people, as people discuss more, I think there will be more information out there. Um, the only ones I could think of were following local directives and safety guidelines for sure. I think you know, that's something that we all were planning on doing anyway. Um, but if you think of under any other sort of best practices in terms of this, um, feel free to let me know and I can collect that and put that into our COVID guide. One thought that I had just now, um, you know, this obviously depends on how you're communicating things to your patrons. Uh, but on the MSL website, we've put like a big red banner uh, with a link to COVID stuff. Um, and that might be a really easy eye-catching way to tell your patrons, we're in phase one of reopening and have a direct link there so people can see what exactly is phase one, what are the services that are available there. Um, having sort of a one-click thing, I think can make it very easy to clarify with the public what phase you're in for reopening and, and where you're at with stuff. Uh, some chatter in the chat box. Uh, Jody put in a link to the CARE Act, so you can um, look in there. And then Abby said that COVID-19 emergency paid sick leave expires on December 31st, 2020. Kara said, is there a specific provision of the CARES Act you wanted to know about? The link to the bill in its entirety is in the chat box. And then federal funding for libraries must be spent by September 30th, but other provisions have, September 30th, 2021, but other provisions have different deadlines. Um, so a few other things to consider. Um, there is modeling and forecasting on the CDC website. Um, there's three main sources of modeling and forecasting, and it's actually an interesting, that's an interesting web page to explore. Um, each of the different models have different definitions and different criteria for the effectiveness of social distancing and of quarantining and all of that. So there's all different kinds of scenarios. Um, I've listed a couple of links on here for federal information regarding reopening, as well as some Montana information from MACO, the Montana Association of counties, I believe, is what that stands for. So those are both really good resources to check in terms of like local government guidance as well as federal government information. Um, and you know, I don't. I hope that this doesn't happen um, because I think most government directives, if not all, are taking direct counsel and advice from health organizations. Um, but there might be some discrepancies in terms of what one organization is saying and what another organization is saying. So being aware that that 
could be a potential, especially as more research comes out, as more information comes out. And so, you know, trying to figure out what, where the library sort of will fall in case, on which side in case that does happen. Um, a few more things in the chat box. Uh, Kara says, yes, the link that Jody provided is more relevant to your question. Kit from Bozeman says, we are looking for wall-mounted hand sanitizers, but have heard there are none to be found. Does anybody here have any suggestions? And then Jody said, based on the governor's recommendations, do we need to buy a thermometer to use on ourselves and staff? If yes, does anyone have suggestions on what kinds and where to get them? Rebecca says, at the Montana Share catalog can add banners regarding reopening phases on your enterprise pages. Send us an updated response to the COVID-19 survey, the link to which is in the chat box. And Abby says, we donated our gloves and masks to the local hospital and now they can't get any. Um, so yeah, I believe there's still probably lots of supply shortages for things, especially gloves and masks. Um, so if anyone has any information on that, that would be great. And let me go ahead and drop these two links into the chat box uh, for you all to have. So I think this is link six. I'm trying to number them because it's otherwise the text gets a little bit lost in the chat box. About the thermometers, um, there there is a infrared thermometer that you can use that you just point at someone's forehead and it takes the temperature. You don't have to touch them so it doesn't have to be disinfected um, and doesn't require the little sheaths or putting things, something in somebody's mouth, which is kind of a weird thing to be doing in the middle of a virus epidemic anyway. Um, so, but those infrared thermometers, I was just checking on Amazon today. I don't know why I knew that question was going to come up. They're like 50 to $80 a piece. And I don't know if that's like just the current inflated price or, and I don't know how long it takes to get them, how available they are. And then Kate, I'll let you go back to the chat box. There's some really good conversation in there. Maybe people just need to undo their mics or, or unmute their mics and you need, maybe need to have a little conversation about some of this stuff. Yeah. Kate says, if you're comfortable with fabric masks, local quilters have taken on the task of making masks. So if you have a local sewing group or quilting group, that might be a good one to reach out to. We were wondering, like, should we make patrons wear masks once we allow them to come back in? And if we do, then should we have to provide those? Or can they, because the staff will have our own that are homemade, but do we need to provide masks? What we're going to do in Whitefish is we're going to put up a reader board out front that basically said, it's going to say, you know, to, to enter the library, you need to have a mask on. I don't think we're going to provide them. Yeah, I would probably is. recommend not providing them to, I'm, I'm afraid of any kind of liability questions. If, mm -hmm. if you provided some that weren't the N95 or something like that. But I think, uh, especially given the, what the governor said today, it's perfectly appropriate to ask people to wear masks. Okay, feel free to ask any other questions, but we'll just go on because um, we are nearing the top of the hour. And then long-term resilience. Um, I believe, Tracy, were you yep. going to talk about this? <laughs> Your memory was good. <laughs> so it's been very helpful that Joe has so much EMT and firefighter experience uh, during a pandemic. I highly recommend having a former or current EMT on your staff. You never know when you might need their skills. She has sent us some great resources and, you know, the term resilience has probably been a little overused, but it, it is a good term in terms of the ability to bounce back. And this is actually much more long-term what I'm talking about here. And it's somewhat related to what Jenny said about patrons, but it's also about your library organization and your staff. 
And basically, if you look at the FEMA planning for reopening, they talk about different communities and how the communities that end up being so much more resilient long term and so much more connected take the time to think about what they want the future to look like. I think in these times, it's really very human and very natural to say, okay, we want to go back to exactly how it was before the COVID-19 closures. That's what we want. That's normal. And we're forgetting that there was probably a lot about that time, or maybe at least some things about that time that actually weren't that great and maybe didn't work that well for us, either as a community or as a library. And so what the FEMA thing does is it kind of asks you to be okay with not immediately trying to put everything back together the way it was and instead think about what you want to build. It, it may not feel like an opportunity right now with all the COVID-19 closures, but it kind of is. It's given you a reason to look at your library and how you do things and say, what would we want this to look like? And it may be things like, for example, um, some library staff might have discovered that they get a lot done when they work from home. Um, so maybe they work in the library at some points, but maybe if they're working on a special project where they need quiet and time to concentrate, they're allowed to work from home. I mean, it could be as simple as that, or it could be some of the things you mentioned on your last webinars talking about more virtual services and how popular those are as well. And that's really what I'm getting at with this particular piece is just Encouraging you if you're ready, because everybody's at a different place and kind of processing COVID-19 and what has happened. But if you're ready, you and your community members might want to take this as an opportunity to think about what kind of community or what kind of library you want to have and what you maybe want to do differently now that you've had this experience with the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Joe, if you want to add anything to that because I can see we're real close to four. So if you do have anything, please feel free to jump in. No, you just covered it. It was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> okay. It is an encouraging message. I, that's Jessica just said that. I think, you know, we are, I certainly feel a real difference in our posture and our position in terms of responding to the crisis and where we are right now in terms of uh, sort of beginning to plan and um, and in that resilience recovery phase. So that's great. Awesome. And then there was a quick message from Cindy. Uh, Kristen, if you don't go through Amazon, you can find infrared thermometers available in May. Amazon is cutting way back. So I recommend you go to the manufacturers directly. And she just found one for $89 from ThermaWorks. Um, and then Joey from Whitefish says, I don't think we've ever been as appreciated as we are now. And then Jody from Red Lodge says, when it comes to decisions about services and programs, I'll be paying attention to other local groups like senior centers, boys and girls club, and child care facilities. I've also asked for direct guidance from our local COVID-19 incident management team. That's a really great plan. Jody, I think it makes total sense to coordinate that with everything else in your community. And if you don't know how to reach your local incident management team, your public health uh, office probably is it or um, knows who is in charge and or your or your Department of Emergency Services. And um, we have those uh, on a on on one of that contact list for DES county and tribal DES on in, in one of your toolkits, uh, Amelia, from a previous session mm -hmm. so yeah. they and they actually would love to hear from you um they will probably really appreciate a heads up that you are thinking about returning to service um rather than finding about out about it later so be in touch with them mm -hmm. they I, i'm also thinking it's possible your health department might be willing to um provide you with some uh uh protective equipment they, they might be have donations of masks that they know about yeah. And they might even have a thermometer they'll give you. I don't know for sure, but if anybody finds out, let us share that, please. Yes, please do. Um, it is four o'clock, so if you do need to head out, please feel free to. We do have a few more resources and pieces of information to share, so we'll just go ahead and do that. Um, 
Humanities Montana, we mentioned this in the previous week, but they're thinking about uh, possibly doing a grant program for libraries, and they were interested to know how libraries might spend grant money. So they were thinking the maximum of $5,000, but if you had the opportunity to apply for a grant like that, what would you want to spend that money on? And if you could let me know, if you could email me or even just drop it in the chat box, that will help Humanities Montana formulate the grant um, and figure out how to create the, the rules and regulations for it. Um, another thing to mention, there is a NAC meeting, the Network Advisory Council on the 23rd, which is tomorrow <laughs> at 2 p.m. Um, it's open to all, so it's listed on the Aspen events calendar, but you're also welcome to contact your representative to contribute thoughts and ideas um, on the agenda. Uh, I did stick into the chat box. The, we've created a new COVID-19 guide on reopening and reentry for libraries. So there are the links that were included from Pam's section of today's webinar. And then there's also more examples from libraries across the country um, and their plans for reopening. I'm in contact with a few others and I'm hoping to add more to that. Um, and I think more will be emerging too in the next few weeks. Um, but uh, please do check back and please do let me know if you have anything to contribute. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to put anything onto that guide. Um, uh, there is a quick question from Starla. Is there a plan for Federation meetings? Um, and I believe that, I'm actually not sure. <laughs> I believe both the there's only two remaining Pathfinder and Tamarack and I believe both are going to be online okay because they didn't okay. know at the time and May is not that far away yes um, Joe also put into the chat box please do complete an evaluation survey um, we are curious to know if these meetup sessions are helpful uh, if there's other topics that you'd like us to cover um, if there's something else that would be useful for us to provide support on. So there's a SurveyMonkey link in the chat box. Please do fill that out and that will help um, help us with future, future sessions. Um, additionally, I wanted to highlight some new uh, resources in the general COVID-19 guide for libraries. There's a section there called providing alternative services and I've put in some links from Tuesday's webinar on virtual story times and programming um, and some libraries shared some of their virtual programming links. So I put those links into the COVID guide under the providing alternative services section and then there's also a few other resources there. One's from Millersville, Millersville Public Library. They did a webinar um, in Tennessee about virtual programming tips and tricks. And then the Alzheimer's Association actually has a lot of virtual programming opportunities. They're actually specifically looking for libraries to help them deliver um, virtual content. So if you're interested in that, please do reach out to them. Um, there's information in that in the COVID guide. And then here are some upcoming webinars. There are MLA webinars happening tomorrow, 10 a.m. with the MSC uh, from On Order to Discard, What the System Can Do for Your Library. 1 p.m. Bibliostat Connect. Uh, there are recordings from past webinars, the Summer Reading Brainstorm Part 1, as well as virtual story times and programming. And then some upcoming webinars next week on Tuesday, on the 28th. I think that's Tuesday. <laughs> uh, it's for sure the 28th. Um, building blocks uh, for economic development. So our economic development consultant, Ann Booth, will be hosting um, this webinar to kind of cover the basics of economic development as a whole, as well as what's happening in Montana. Um, and I do encourage you all to come with any questions, topics that you're interested in. Um, and it, I think it'll be a mixture of both a presentation and also a brainstorming session so that we can know what you all are interested in and help us guide uh, future projects. Uh, there are library standards, um, public comment sessions uh, on May 1st and May 5th. There is also a little hand signing, um, not feeling sings, feeling signs. <laughs> the theme will be feeling signs that you all can learn some sign language that you can work into your story times. Uh, that's with Kathy McMillan, who is super great. Um, 
and that's going to be from 1 to 2 p.m. And then there's going to be another summer reading brainstorm on May 8th from 11 to 12 p.m. So just wanted to mention that I will make sure to send out reminders on Wired as well. Um, and uh, anyone is welcome to attend any of these sessions. Uh, Weston asked, when will this webinar be put on Vimeo? Uh, I'm hoping to do that tomorrow. Uh, the recording takes a little bit of time to process. Um, so by tomorrow, I should have that ready uh, and can send that out on Wired. There's um, four more MLA uh, webinars scheduled to, those are all, all on Thursdays, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. I don't have them all listed in um, Aspen yet. I've been working on that, so, but they'll, there's four more coming. Mm -hmm. So I'll go ahead and stop the recording now, uh, but please feel 